who's that over there? That's Aloy. Um, and uh, we are here to talk about gaming stuff and other geeky stuff. And uh, this will probably wander all over the place. Um, although we do have kind of a topic to start with that was suggested. Um, I threw I threw just a qu- I threw the question out Aloy. Um, like, hey, is there anything you'd like to hear a couple of game designers talk about? Um, and I got a few suggestions, and I thought, uh, since this one's sort of a perennial, it's one that com- comes up, like, it's one of those things that I've, I've heard the debate, like, since the day I started gaming, mm-hmm. um, which was to say, um, min-maxing versus, like, deep immersive role-playing. And can the two coexist together? And what's, you know, like what's good and bad about each one? And what, you know, what it it comes down to a lot of preferences and a lot of, you know, people have strong opinions, right? Like everybody, yeah. there's people out there who like the game side of role playing games where it's like, well, if you're not rolling dice and you're not figuring out stats and, um, you know, calculating some things and, um, you know, digging deep into the rule books, then it's not as satisfying for them. Yeah. Um, and then there are people who are like, I don't give a crap if I roll a die at all for the entire game <laughs> session. Um, if I get to role play a character and have a lot of uh, interesting um, interactions with the other players and with the GM. Um, well, what, I, what else? What I'll state right up front, because I think sure. we, might, we might be de- we might be defining our our, our conversation here slightly different because I feel like story game versus simulationist is different than the conversation of min maxing versus story driven character creation. Well, there's story driven character creation. There's also like story oriented role playing. I think, I think one of the, 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 I think the question was born or the suggestion was born out of the idea of, um, you know, if you're, if you're playing a game that is got enough rules, crunch to it that you can min max that you can kind of pull from the system and find all the little combos that go together and that's your preoccupation like can a person who does that um reasonably i guess also get into the role playing side of it or can that game support that like if a game is you know if 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 you've got people who are getting heavy under the crunch and making sure they want to make sure that mechanically their their character is doing all these great things like the gm also is kind of like expected maybe or that you know the social contract amongst the group yeah. is that the gm is going to make sure that we're doing things that involve role playing you know uh, rolling dice and we're making sure that you get a chance to take advantage of all the time and effort you've put into min maxing your character yeah. up. um and then you know if you do a lot a lot a lot of that then you end up with less time to put into like, well, we're just going to spend the next two hours role playing um, social interactions in this tavern and in the town square and at this festival and, um, and so forth. And like, there's, there's no right answer to any of this. Oh, of course Um, not. It's just a question of like, just talking about what, what, what all the different aspects of it are um, and how, how the two, like how you, how they can coexist, I guess, maybe with like, if you have, if you're playing a game that has a lot of crunch and you want to play and and focus on that, but then also um, have a lot of, uh, you know, like really kind of entertaining, immersive role-playing experiences. Right. So, well, I mean, I, I I think, uh, and yeah, you're right. There's not really a good answer. Um, (laughs) I like to look at the extremes a little bit. So, like, if we look at the extremes on both ends, um, one is, like, you, like, why even make a character or just play a story game where you draw a couple cards and then create a story around it and then you're done. There's no min-maxing involved uh, because there is no crunchy mechanics or anything like that. Um, you know, then you get people who uh, want to, I don't want to say abuse, but, you know, exploit you know, the system so that their character is the most badass ever on, you know, on the face of the earth. Uh, I think I remember before, the nice way of saying that is that they game the system. Well, yes. And because no. the system presents that to you, right? Yeah. If, if the game, if the system is crunchy, it's inviting you. Yes. Oh my gosh. To, yeah. to play those pieces. Yes. As a game designer, uh, every piece of a game that I design, I want you to mess with. Like, that's the point. Uh, I remember I had somebody at a con, come up to me and they had a, a character that they had made up in, in Apocalypse Prevention Inc. API. And uh, they were like, 
well, I broke your system. I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> and I said, did you? And he goes, yeah, I, uh, I made a character who gets like plus 30 to all my grappling checks. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. What does he do if he's in court? And he has to present his case because he grappled that guy to death. Uh, <laughs> do you have those things? Uh, and he's like, oh, no, not really. I put all my points in my grappling. I'm like, well, then you didn't break the system. You just hyper-focused. Yeah. Uh, and it just means you're bad at everything else. <laughs> so, um, which, which is, that for me is where the min-maxing can become an issue, is when you have those one-trick pony kind of characters that can do one thing, they can do it very well, and if anything else is happening in the game, then they are completely useless. Uh, that, that to me, is like a, a terribly min-maxed kind of character. Well, if if the people at the table with that person recognize, okay, this person has this thing that they want to do really well, and they've they've that's what they enjoy in the game, and the GM makes sure that they get the opportunity to do that every so often, and that player understands that they're going to kind of suck at a lot of the other stuff, um, and but that they're going to just enjoy the moments when they just you know completely kick ass at whatever the thing is that they're good at, um, and you know, the players, rec the other players recognize that, okay, well, my care, our characters are going to have to pick up the slack to deal with all that other stuff, which is kind of what you usually get out of party design anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, characters filling different roles and making sure that the group can kind of handle a lot of different situations. Then it's, oh, it, it's probably all right. Now that's a home group where everybody kind of knows each other. And the expectation right. is you know, like, you know, that, you know, Joe Bob over here wants to be able to, uh, grapple like nobody's business <laughs> well, i think too, it, i think it also speaks to um uh, those games that work uh that party design is part of the game's design also is that you know like not every game does that as a matter of fact not that many games do that there's actually like pretty much the big ones like D D and pathfinder like those ones are like these classes and you should have this many of this because the they do these certain things and you know, like I remember, I remember that uh, I was trying to play like fourth edition and I was like, uh, oh, I really want to play a wizard. It's like, we already have two wizards. Now, nah, if we have three wizards, it just ruins everything. We can't do that. So we have to have <laughs> thing. like, so like it, it completely like the, the who the party is, is like, that is a huge deal for those games. But like, if you play a game that you are making, say, individuals that don't necessarily need to conform to any particular class, you know, like for instance, like if we were playing, you know, um, you know, big strong hands, you wouldn't be like, well, I mean, we have to have a stone can, we have to have a fawn, uh, you know, we have to have a fairy. Otherwise the whole group dynamic just gets thrown out of it and everybody's going to lose and die. Like, no, it's like <laughs> we're the individuals in that kind of game. Uh, and obviously those have playbooks. So everything is, balanced in a certain way but let's say for instance it's that kind of setup and i'm like well i'm going to play the fawn and i can run really fast uh and that's what i do so but like i can't catch anything uh, i can't throw a punch to save my life uh you know it's like i can run and i can jump uh and i know it says on my character sheet that i can play music but i didn't put any points in music because i put all those points into my running so uh <laughs> So that's what I'm mostly saying is like, that's the kind of min maxing. Uh, yes. In a game where cool, it's, it's okay. If you were going to hyper-focus because everybody's hyper-focusing, I think that that's different than a game where, uh, you know, if you're playing actual characters who are expected to have real world experience, then you would be able to do more than just one thing. Um, yeah. To an extent, I think that even with character point build type characters, um, where you can you could be like literally kind of jack of all trades and just have a little bit of everything, or you could focus into some areas. Like I think that there's probably plenty of groups that will still be like, okay, we 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 want somebody to kind of be the face of the group and be mm -hmm. good with social abilities, and we want somebody that can you know cover our butts and, and kick a little ass if necessary, yeah. and we want somebody that's sneaky. Um, and you're not necessarily you don't have a class that kind of defines what that is, right. but people will build kind of. Um, build into roles that do those sorts of things. But then, um, 
you know, usually those types of builds don't allow you, you can get focused, but you can't necessarily get hyper focused. Um, because it depends it, on the game, yeah. It, 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 yeah, there's, 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 you know, if, if a game has enough rules, you can hyper focus. Like yeah. if, if there's enough <laughs> crunch, um, and enough source books, you can hyper focus. But on like, you know, if you've got like a, like a, an indie game that's like one, everything's in one book, um, and it's all, and all the different types of characters are just character builds, there's probably not like too much yeah. that gets you like super duper good at one thing, yeah. um, to the, to the detriment of everything else. Um, but then, you know, on the flip side of that is like, like there's, it's perfectly reasonable to play like, you know, we're just going to pick on uh, that grapple thing again. Like, you know, play the, the grapple character that can grapple up and down the, the, uh, the battle map and just like lo lock any bad guy down and keep them from doing yeah. anything and pin them and keep them from being uh, a threat. You can certainly still you may not be able to make the social checks, but you, as far as role play goes, there's nothing stopping you from playing a very deep, well-developed character that has a lot of nuance and really interesting personality to them. Um, I think that maybe, maybe people who tend toward making crunchy, super duper cool combat characters, maybe some of the times aren't as interested in worrying about making a character that's super cool role play. You know, like, mm -hmm. like that's a really deep personality. Maybe I think there's probably plenty of players who would be perfectly happy doing that. But, um, you know, for the people, I think for, 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 for a certain subset of players who really dig the rule thing and they're playing an adventure game yeah, where there are challenges to overcome and you make a plan and you roll dice, um, that, uh, the, the, the role playing side of thing is, is secondary or even tertiary in their minds. Well, that, I mean, definitely, but then and I, that's, think, I, I think that's where the perception comes from. Right. But I, I think it also, then I think that that falls on the GM, right? So there's, there's, cause exactly what you just said is what happens at a lot of these tables. The person spends all their points in fighting and grappling and like, that's all they can do, but the players swap and can talk their way out of stuff, you know, and there's a lot of games where like the GM will be like, yeah, that sounds good. So yeah, you know, that happens because you said so good. Uh, whereas technically <clears throat> you're supposed to be like, but then make that role. Cause I do that at my table. Uh, Cause I'll have somebody who will be like, oh, well, obviously I walk up to them and I, and I, you know, kiss their hand and I do all that stuff. And I, you know, and I bow to them and I do all this. And I go like, you're the character with the really low intelligence and like no points in etiquette. I guess make an intelligence plus etiquette role to see if that is doing right. Thing. You right. know, um, but I've been at many, many tables where if the player says the right thing, the GM just hand waves it uh, and sure. doesn't necessarily put that on the character. And that goes to the table culture. Yeah. Um, like where, you know, if, if you've got a, a culture at the table where the GM is going to like, okay, well, let's just kind of roll through. If it was a fun role playing moment, we were all entertained by your suave mm -hmm. debonair super grappler who shouldn't be able to make that social check. We're not, we're not going to worry about social checks, you know, right. we'll just, we'll just let you have fun with that moment. And okay. Okay. You, you, you know, you woo the, you woo the lady or you bamboozle the guard or whatever it is you were trying to do. Yeah. So I guess really. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about, though, I mean, I think it's the, the, the player's focus and the, the table culture. Because the, the player focus, the people who are trying to min-max, uh, like, like me, myself, I'm a systems guy. You know, I, I immediately will go into a system, I'll read everything, and I'll see what kind of combos I can come up with. Um, but then I am also not somebody to hyper-focus any of my characters. I wouldn't say that I'm a full-on jack-of-all-trades kind of player, uh, I will usually be like, I'm very good at two or three things, and then the rest I'm kind of general. Uh, I'm never like, I'm the best in the world at one thing. Uh, but, you know, it is good to know where your strengths lie. But uh, I think, though, that it, I think it is kind of the idea that if I wanted to, I could exploit the game and come to the table. And, you know, a lot of what role-playing is, is people trying to feel, uh, a, you know, 
I'm not going to say everybody, but I've had my share of, you know, people who I have gamed with who basically want to become a role playing character so they can have a, like a power trip. So they're like, I can do this amazing thing better than anyone else. And if I wanted to, I could do it to your character, you know, cause, cause the table culture is also PVP is allowed. So, uh, you know, I'm going to do everything. Right. I'm the best in the world. And that's what they're there for. And they're there to break the game. Um, <laughs> and not necessarily play the game. Now there, are, and so you, what I like to do personally is I definitely utilize the rules. I mean, you know, min maxing, it has a bad rap, but really it's just about utilizing your points to the best of your ability to make your character useful. Because I've also made characters that I made them uh, completely based off of like story driven. Uh, so I'll put points in things that I like would re reflect the character and it makes sense for their backstory. And then like, they don't matter in the game. You know, which of course, that's, that is that's table culture as well as bad game design because everything. If you're going to make a skill, <laughs> if there if you're going to have a skill in your game, there should be a use for that skill in your game. But I've played so many games where I'm like, this basket weaving. I mean, I just I have no use for this skill. Why do I? Why does this exist in the game? Why did you give it to me as an option to spend points on basket weaving? Because. Uh, <laughs> I'm also the kind of player who would be like basket weaving. That's weird. Let's put some points into that and see what happens. You know, um, I, I ran into that with capers where there's a skill called willpower that mostly comes into play. If you take mind affecting powers, cause you make checks that involve willpower. Mm -hmm. um, but I would, when I was running playtest man and people were making characters, I would have them. People would, would take willpower as a skill. They only get like four skills and they would take willpower a lot. And I'd, mm -hmm. I'd have to just like tell people, it's like, okay, I realize you're not super duper familiar with the game, um, but here's what willpower usually is useful for. You might yeah. find it limited its usefulness um, just as a, as a general skill. Um, I, and I that, think that, that's, that's, probably, that's probably a failing of the design. It's a, I think that that's a, it's a wording thing because will, like if, 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 I, if I think of willpower in role-playing games, I think vampire. And it's what you use to resist things. Yeah. So, you and know, if why, I was that, that is what it's, like, like, it's, it's not as that? that. That is what you know. That's what it can be. That's one of the things it can be used for. But it's not. Right. It doesn't come into play the way it does in Vampire because Vampire the, the characters are constantly resisting with willpower. Like the mechanics mm -hmm. are built where willpower is very very important. Where yeah. you know your character in in Capers, your character is just not being mentally tortured or kept awake at night as often <laughs> exactly. as a vampire is as a vampire is being like, you know, throttled by, by some uh, mind discipline. Well, and I think or, that that or has keeping, a lot or keeping from feeding when they're hungry. Right. Well, yeah, that. well, but I think that that Getting has a lot to do with, um, that's with the, uh, you know, with the, the intent, right. Cause it's also a superhero game. Uh, I know lots of people, I think I told this story a, a couple of sessions ago. I don't, or a couple of, things ago but like uh i was talking to my friend and they were like yeah we're we're we're, we're gearing up to play a, a new you know uh supers game and i'm like oh that sounds pretty cool like do you have any ideas for your character and he's like well i'm thinking about playing a duplicator uh but you know mark's gonna be in the game so i have to take a whole bunch of mental resistance because you know he's gonna play somebody with mind control and he's gonna want to mess around with everybody so and i'm like see and that's the part that's the part of it that i'm like that that ruined like why invent don't invite that person to your game like i just wouldn't even do it because if i as a player know that out of character i have to spend points so that another player doesn't mess with me um that's that's bad. Like, don't invite that guy to a game. That's what I say. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> or 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 try to have a talk with them and say, you know, hey, could you could you? We've we, we've seen your trick. We've seen the thing. We know you love doing it. We've seen it. It's you know, like maybe yeah. maybe maybe play something else. Um, but that is a thing in supers games, right? Yeah. So if there's superheroes involved, we've all had enough exposure to superhero pop culture. Uh, we've all played soup, soup games. We, you know, all this stuff. We know that there's mind manipulators out there. So I'm gonna take some willpower. If you know, I've, even if I only got four skills, one of them's gonna be willpower because I'm not gonna. Yeah. Be mind uh, but you know, that's all. But also, you already kind of said that like mind control and stuff is not necessarily a big thing in capers anyway. It's not a big part of the game. 
Right. Which I think there might be the disconnect there too. People are expecting exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. They're expecting, oh, it's a supers game, so there's going to be a bunch of mind control. So I'll take willpower so that I don't, I don't, um, you know, lose agency over my character. And I was like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. The G, the the, the designer of this game hates it when people when players <laughs> lose agency over their character. So he didn't put mind control in this game. Yeah. <laughs> I put it in my supers game, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's important. It's important to have that. It, it, I think you need it, but it just needs to be, there needs to be limitations and there, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's a very tricky thing to design uh, and, and design it good. I mean, cause anybody can write and then you tell them what to do on a page, you know? So it's, it's yeah. about um, having, you know, realistic uh, limitations that allow for the power to still be interesting and fun to use and play without it being like this, you know, giant consent, you know, revoking thing at the table. So it becomes, it, it's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky needle to thread. Well, and it's one of those things that you just, you decide, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to create this. I'm going to put it in there. I'm going to try to balance it, make sure that it's not inherently just going to just constantly F with players. And then you have to just sit back and say, okay, well, there it is. And I trust the players to use it in the way that will be enjoyable for them at the table. Exactly. And so, and for some groups that will be just be, that will be, be like, okay, we can use this and you can screw around with other players. And some groups are going to be like, well, we're not going to use that power. Yeah. And, just, and the bad guys aren't going to have it either. <laughs> it's a super duper rare power. <laughs> like almost no one has it. Like one person has it. So I had to write it in the book, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <clears throat> Anything but no, else, I think anything that, else to say yeah. about min maxing or I mean there's there's always more to say <laughs> about min maxing, you know. I mean that's because that's the thing, is uh because you end up well, I mean, because there's a thing, right? It's like you can you can try and design your character and create your character to do a certain thing. It doesn't have to be the only thing that they do, but I mean, I guess you could do that, but to me, that's what to me, that is, I guess, hyper specialization, which isn't necessarily min maxing. Um, you know, the 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 term min maxing means the minimum number of points spent for the maximum output. So, like, really, if you think about it, like, like that's not a bad thing. Like, see, and here's know, the like, thing: if I, <laughs> you just blew my mind because what? I have never thought that that's what the min stands for, ever. Oh, what did to you me, think it stood for? Min means that there are some things that you are going to absolutely minimize so that you can maximize other things, mm. which is the offset of having things that you're just terrible at so that you can have these other things that you're incredibly good at and will rarely fail at. Okay. Okay. So, so part, of the, the, the part, of the dis part of the disconnect is like it just in the, the way people look at. Yeah. the term and the idea, like, you know, people use the term mid maxing all the time. I wonder how many people out there, you have a specific definition in their head and whether they re and do they think that everybody else has that same definition. Right. Because until right. you said that right there, I thought everybody thought the thing I thought. <laughs> Literally. I thought yeah. that's what everybody thought min maxing meant. You I, minimize I, some I, things to maximize other things. I think it depends because I, yeah. I, I, think, it's, <laughs> I think it's where you thought, like, I think it's like where you started, where you learned your terminology and whatnot. Like, you know, like, uh, it was I, I had role played already for at least five years before I ever knew what a dump stat was. You know, like it's just not a term that I ever used because to me, all stats were like super important. And like there was never one like, ah, you don't need charm. It's just like, a, uh, or <laughs> it's like, of course you need charisma. What are you talking about? How are you going to get henchmen? How are you going to woo the princess? You need charisma. What's wrong with you? I also play a lot of bards. So that's a thing. <laughs> So um, I play elven bards because that's why charisma exists. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean, but I've always, I've always kind of thought it's, uh, you know, the minimum, minimum like spending for the maximum effect, but then it's also about obviously the hyper specialization as well. But most people do the hyper specialization. It depends on, it depends on the game. I also, I also sure, feel sure. like, I also feel like when it, it, it depends on the game, because like if you take a game, for instance, like um, like Ninja Crusade that I make, like 
everybody is basically like a walking army, you know, like everybody is a ninja. And so like, it's expected that all of the ninja are going to be really like amazing fighters and can take you out and whatnot. Um, but there are ways to even specialize on like certain weapons and certain jutsu and all these different things. So you can definitely specialize and go in different directions, but the way that character creation is, is it's, it's very like, it's step by step. You, everybody starts off with the same number of points and the same number of blah, blah, blah. It's just where you spend them. Um, so there's not even necessarily really any fear of any one character becoming way more powerful or anything just because they've been min max like oh i spent a bunch of points in my fighting and i can use a sword really well and it's just like well i spent a bunch of points over here in my persuasion and i have this jutsu that allows me to drop hypnotic suggestions in the people and like sure i can't swing a sword as good but i can tell you to drop the sword and you might do that you know it's like so like there's always a counter for everything you know whereas i think when min maxing started I think it obviously it started in D&D with dumb stat and stuff where, you know, people were digging around in dungeons, fighting dragons and finding out that charisma did not come into play because uh, all we're doing is beheading goblins and, you know, um, you know, killing basilisks. So I don't need to be good at talking to, to do that. Sure. You know? <laughs> As long as I've got my catchphrase for after the the kill strike, exactly. Spoon. Uh, I'm good. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, I think that's where a lot of it comes from. But if you if you start on that type of game, if that's like what your like what your initial impression of what role playing is, then I think that that becomes uh, more of a mindset than if you start off with something like more story gamey or more indie. Uh, more story driven even if it is you know even if it is crunchy and stuff like just ones that have more story to them uh and it's not just you know hunt the thing kill the thing take it stuff so um you know min maxing becomes something different you know if you're playing like a courtroom drama rpg i don't even know if one exists that would be cool i play that um, then obviously like persuasion would be an amazing skill because I mean, I have to play the lawyer and I have to convince the cop to give up the, you know, the CI and all that, you know, it's, there's a bunch of persuasion checks in, in there. Sure. Uh, you know, throwing a book is not that necessary unless you're then playing a cop because then you have to be able to do the fighting to take down the bad guy and all that stuff. They need to make a, like a CSI law and order RPG, something like that. Like a, like a, like a crime. <laughs> procedural. I know. Like, I know there's systems that can do procedural stuff, but I like I would want it to be specifically for that. Hmm. <laughs> Det, uh, like scientific detection, de 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 detectivism, where it's you know forensics and yeah science and everything that's built into stuff, well, as, opposed, have, as opposed to just like it. looking for clues. With you'll have like the detectives and the police officers. And then you'll have the CSI people and then you'll have the lawyers over here and it'll be a three pronged approach. <laughs> and then like, we, Oh no, that's awesome. Cause then you can sell it. You can sell it as like, um, like case files would be like the source book. So it'd be like this case, you know, <laughs> sure. you play the cop, you play the lawyer, you play the CSI person, bam, three players, each one. And like working together, they'll be able to solve this case. Well, yeah. if you were if you were going to do a Law and Order RPG, you everybody would play. Every player would portray two characters, right? Mm. You'd play you'd play a, a police officer slash forensic investigator, um, and then you'd also play a lawyer slash paralegal, whatever you know, it's like member of the legal team, because the the, the game session is going to be broken up into two pieces. Oh, true. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to catch the criminal, and then you're going to prosecute them. Yeah. No, that's true. Oh, and then like, no, that no, that's really good. That, I like that a lot. Um, yeah. See, see, everybody, we just designed a game. It's there. out of it. Give give Dick Wolf a, Dick Wolf a call and see if uh, if the Law and Order uh, license is available for RPGs. I think he might be into that. <laughs> I don't think Dick Wolf knows what an RPG is. Hey, uh, is Dick Wolf an old white guy? 
Probably. I'm assuming. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he's one of those, I believe he's been, he's one of those guys that he's been doing you know, like TV shows for freaking ever. I'm just saying there's a whole lot of old white guys in our hobby. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> hello. <laughs> exactly. So. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, hey, don't get me wrong. I'm right there with you. Like as far as like the whole turning TV properties into RPGs or making RPGs that are inspired by TV properties. I mean, I'm I'm doing one. I have an idea for another one. I was trying to figure out earlier today. I found myself thinking, could you make Scrubs into an RPG? And I just I don't know if I have the hook for it. I don't know what it would be because it's a you know like you can do a medical RPG. There's um, there's Mashed which is a uh, PBTA game powered by the apocalypse game called yeah. mashed. That is, that is modeled off of the TV show yeah. mash. And yeah. so it has, it has the comedic antics of the surgeons and the staff okay. um, at the mash unit, but it's also very much about like, you know, they're actually like, you know, doing God's work, so to speak there, you know, right. they're, they're saving right. lives and, and doing all that. Whereas like scrubs is, like it has its dramatic moments and the characters do doctor things. And it's, it's actually received a lot of accolades from actual medical professionals as being very realistic. Wow. Um, but it's also very much comedy and a buddy, you know, it's a buddy show um, and it's a relationship show. And like, I don't know, I don't know. I'm sure there's a game in there somewhere. I just don't know like how, how you would couple the, the, the comedic drama of the relationship kind of stuff with uh yeah. with actually having the characters like um practice medicine and everything and and be like informed about that too because like you know the medical field is one of those things that's like you if, if you want to portray it in a game you'd kind of like to portray it at least like half correctly like you know, <laughs> if somebody says that you know this patient has a has a tension pneumothorax you better know what that means right <laughs> Because otherwise, you're not going to be able to make any intelligent decisions for your character. Whenever I design anything, I design with a, like lots of generalities. Like I know people are like very much into like gun porn games, uh, sure. where you know the modern games where they're just like, well, obviously I have an HGPX 1050 with the blah 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 bullets and stuff. And I remember I was running, I was running one of my games, and they were just like, so I want like a desert eagle and blah blah blah, and I'm like. Would you consider that a light, medium, or heavy firearm? Uh, I probably medium, probably. Cool. Here are the stats for a medium firearm because I don't care what model it is. Like, yeah, that's generalities all around. I I do that plenty as well, but like, you know, like if you're if you're doing the doctor thing, it's like if you if you diagnose a particular thing, okay. Does do you need an antiviral and antibacterial? Do you need a steroid treatment? I mean, like you know, there are there are specific things that this is what you have to use for it to make any sort of sense. Um, what what I think you could probably do is you could have again, kind of like those kind of pre written like adventures that would have that information based on what each one was and what you were trying to solve and whatnot. But then, as game designer. What you would really be designing is just the 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 procedure of what you do uh, as a doctor. So the procedure would be intake, um, then you know speaking with the with the patient to try and get the right information, then running tests, interpreting those tests. Um, yeah, it would be it would be primarily about diagnosis and once you've diagnosed yeah. you could play it to the level of diagnosis and say okay well we've diagnosed that this is the problem right. and we'll treat you with the appropriate thing for that and then right. just kind and of then, that's where that ends you don't well, you don't get then, into like well we treated them we treated them with this thing but now there's a complication and it's like that's getting probably too deep for most uh people who want to even play the game much less the guy who wants to design it yeah i mean i don't know i, I think that's, that's your good. thing like it would be like, oh, this is only solved with surgery. Okay, cool. So now we have to make some surgery rolls to see if you, you know, Zusa, oh, there was a complication. You made a bad roll. Okay, well, the person's, you know, now we need the, you know, we have to do the shocker things, like whatever, like, you know. <laughs> the uh, you know. See, that's exactly that's the problem. problem, using the shocker <laughs> things. <laughs> the shocker things. That's what you need. Uh, that are, but that's con the thing, that are constantly used in medical shows in ways that they're not actually used in real life. Right, which is why we would use them in that way in the RPG.
Right. <laughs> but with the, dis- with the disclaimer in the book that says, this is not actually what doctors do, but it makes for, it makes for exciting drama when they well, hit you with, the, when they hit, the hit you with the defibrillator. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't, I don't know if Scrubs is the right <laughs> show to turn into an RPG, but I just, I just like, yeah. Cause I've been toying around with the ideas of, of TV shows into, into games. Um, and so I've just like, I've popped through a few, like we, 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 we we've got law and order nailed down. We know how that needs to go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, just like as long hell, as long as we're talking about that, like what can you think of another other than like, other than TV shows that are like clearly adventure shows. Yeah. Or horror shows. Right. Um, which, you know, they, they, they automatically kind of lend themselves to being good for RPGs. Like, I'm just like, what, what can you think? Can you think of anything that would be like you said, a cop cop oriented show or a law, a lawyer oriented show. Um, I, I, know, I know a bunch of firefighters translate and nicely doing a firefighter game would be very boring. Uh, they spend a lot of their time kind of hanging out, waiting for fires. And yeah, but like, not on the but not on the TV show. Not on, oh on TV shows. Oh my god, there's a fire every day. It's, oh my everywhere. And it's <laughs> yeah. just like no, like. Um, but mostly firefighters, they'll go, they'll like they'll go days without any calls and without a fire. Plenty of calls. Well, they'll get calls, but they won't get it for a fire, right? Like yeah, it'll be it'll fire. be for you know somebody that needs medical assistance they're all they're right. all EMTs so, so they're rushing off to help somebody that's having a heart attack exactly. or <clears throat> is uh so that could know. be interesting but then <laughs> like at that but point you, you to, might have to get an overall it, EMT yeah but if then of. if you then you got to you know you, you you have to introduce like this you know melodrama in the firehouse kind of thing too oh, like, yeah, like let the the character relationships have <laughs> have a have a role so that you can so that your game loop you know like they talk about you can have the game loop of like well the characters are interacting with each, with each other and they, you set up some sort of um uh conflict between characters um that does not get resolved and then right. you have the call and they have to go off and do the thing and the characters somehow have to work together or they, they earn a new respect for each other or they learn something important about each other or whatever that ultimately comes back full circle and allows them to resolve the earlier conflict. And now they move forward into the next game loop. Right. And right. where you have other characters that are at having some sort of a conflict. So what about, what about, <laughs> what about baking challenges, the RPG? <laughs> Um, well, there are like, plenty of like very experimental games out there that have to do with actually having food on the table, and and, and you could make a RPG that literally involves cooking. Really? Sure. I mean, name name some of the ones that that you're referencing. Do you do you know? Any uh, I have I don't have a title off the top of my head, but I know because I get a glimpse at, at um like this last year with the Indie Groundbreaker Awards. Actually, mm-hmm. like the last two years, because I was last this, this past year, I was I was involved in helping to select the judges that were going to be on. So I was also getting a look at like what they were looking at. Um, and then the year before I had entered. So I was also checking out like the other games that had you know, been entered okay. in the same categories that I was in. I, I va- it, it, it might have been an Indie Groundbreaker Award game. It might have been something that was adjacent to that that I just heard about because of that. But it was a game that had to do with like um, courses at a meal. Um, hmm. and, uh, and, and ah, I just, I, I don't want to misrepresent. I, I can't remember exactly sure. what it's about, but, but there's, but there's experimental. There's, there's some really, um, some, some really creative stuff that's being done by all sorts of people that are doing, you know, where it's not just like, Oh, this is an adventure game and you roll dice. You know, they're, 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 uh, they're, they're games that get into, uh, some pretty heavy philosophical topics and, yeah. Um, get into very human condition kind of things and um and then and then just kind of you know um other really kind of out there stuff where you like have a game that's like literally part of it is going geocaching mm-hmm. like um so you actually there's a physical like you got to hike out into the wilderness somewhere and do a thing um 
and uh, uh, you know stuff that has to do that has cooking involved. I don't know, like what, as far as a role playing game that like is built around a cooking show, because cooking show those those shows have their drama, right? They have their judges that all have kind of their distinct personalities that act certain ways, and they're there to entertain in a certain way. Like you could you could make a game out of that. Yeah, the, like the GM would be the host. Um, sure, and you can have the players rotate around between being judges and being contestants and you know when you play a judge you have to have like this distinct personality type that that you you kind of stick to so like are you the a-hole or are you the really nice person or are you the like the 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 really the really uh like accomplished chef who's very technical you know you could just play different parts and then the other players have to kind of play to in addition to making the cooking checks and doing you know like making interesting things and coming up with uh, exciting dishes from the ingredients that they're given they also have to kind of play to the the personalities so to speak of the uh of the of the of the judges that could be fun <laughs> that does sound like it's much more of a role playing thing and less of a mechanics thing uh so <laughs> Well, I think I think you could have like just a little bit of mechanics for like making the dish. It, like you have yeah. to come up with an interesting way to combine everything. Yeah, and, and then you have a check that you make, um, and then um, the there might also be a check that you make that involves like how like when you when you play up to the judge when you kind of try to get them on your side or whatever. Like there might be a check that's involved there, and then the person that's playing the judge has to kind of adjust how they treat. <laughs> the contestant character based on like, you know, if, if they, if they rolled, rolled the check, you know, if the check succeeded really well, then they have to be really, con, you know, conciliatory and congratulatory and everything. Yeah. They um, rolled and, and if they roll poorly, then the judge can really rip into them or, exactly. <laughs> and it just cool. becomes, the checks become, uh, just ways to, uh, uh, guide the improvisation. Right. Right. Of the character interaction. I think pretty cool. I, I kind of dig that. <laughs> All right, so we'll put that on the docket. That'll be another game you and I'll design together. Yeah, yeah. I've never watched a cooking show like that, like more than like an, an episode. <laughs> of them, and my my youngest son, he's four, but like since it's holidays, like during Halloween, we would watch the Halloween baking challenge. Now that it's like you know Christmas time, we're watching the Christmas cookie challenge, where sure. it's people make types of cookies and it's just like he's <laughs> i'm like all right if this will get you to go to bed let's go ahead and watch it i guess like <laughs> whatever will make you go to bed oh man I'm trying to think of like what have i well i've been watching mash recently but we already talked about mash as a show or as a game yeah. <laughs> i've been i've been re-watching the fresh prince of bel-air after they had the reunion thing yeah, that they the did thing the reunion reunion was really good. Did yeah. you watch it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I enjoyed it. I, I figured I would probably enjoy it in general, but I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, like, I really dug it. It's it's one of the better reunion shows that I've seen for for a, for a TV show like that. You know, like twenty years after the fact, or well, thirty years since the show <laughs> since the show premiered. Twenty four yeah. years since it ended. Yeah, it's kind of crazy because. Um... I don't know. There were there were a few things that I was just like, mm, I don't know if this is just editing and then, you know it's, it's kind of irking me. But you know, like I, like the 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 Will and Aunt Viv uh, that conversation, it kind of it kind of irked me because like I've I, like I've seen her talk about her experience after, and it, it I also was bad. It, it was bad. It was really bad, and it was that ended very really very badly. Bad. For people uh, who aren't uh, aware, the uh, the actress who played Aunt Viv for the first three seasons left the show, um, and it was a very very bad parting um, yeah. with her and the producers, with her and Will Smith. Um, well, it was not even just a bad parting, but it was all the aftermath was bad. Uh, so, yeah, the like, aftermath of it, it 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 kind of it kind of ruined her career. Yeah. Um, it it painted her as a difficult to work with, and it was yeah really really terrible. But they had a they had a reconciliation on the show, and it was clearly like it was edited. They had a much longer conversation, yeah. and they, we they saw must- parts of it. But well, I mean, and I think the biggest thing for me was that um, watching it, Will did not apologize for not really in it. He kind of uh, half-assed apologized at the tail end, where he was kind yeah, of after she after she said she was sorry. 
Exactly. And that, that part I think for me was the worst, like all the rest of it. I was like, this is really cool. And then they were like that. And I was like, oh, it's like that. Uh, I don't like it. I didn't like it. Um, but um, I will, I will say this, I will say this, given that she walked out of that very unfairly back in the day um, as being painted as the difficult one, whether people still believe that or not, or what kind of prejudices they hold. The fact that, it's there's part of you that wants Will Smith to be the person that says, I'm sorry, because he caused all of that to be the one who says, I'm sorry first. But then also it it's, you know, maybe there's there's maybe the way they edited it was, you know, the way they did. And sure. her, her saying that, she, you know, that her saying um, she was sorry to him first to help maybe, maybe helps paint her a little, like helps to reconcile some of that bad feeling. Like people won't look at her as being quite as bad, even though like he's, the, he um, was the dick. Do you know really? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, no, no. it's, it's all perception. Yeah, I think to the, to the person who doesn't know and they just think that, Oh, she left and she was, you know, difficult and all that stuff. Then yeah, they're probably like, Oh cool. They made up. But like, I know the, I know the whole story. Like yeah. I've heard it and it's like that, that's not how that should have ended. Uh, yeah, so, it, was, it was it was a little too pretty for an ending. It, yeah, like they're well, and I have uh, a I have a feeling I have a feeling somewhere in those in that cut footage, somewhere in that cut footage they yelled at each other a little bit. Oh, I'm sure. You know, like um, we we didn't see that. They had a very civil conversation in what was the next scene was when she joined the rest of the cast and yeah. um and uh, Carlton Alfonso I forgot his last name he was Fair. not there. Now they have said that it's because like, oh, he had filming, he had to go do America's Funniest Home Videos. And I'm just like, you, you saying that for the reunion, he couldn't call in that day? I don't know if I believe that. Um, but as soon as she arrived, he wasn't there. Uh, and I know yeah. that they have even more kind of bad blood because when she would talk out in the past, Will Smith would say nothing because Will Smith is Will Smith. He's up here. He's like, I don't have to say anything. But yeah. But Alfonso Roberto, I remember his name, but Alfonso Roberto was out there Ribeiro. saying, Ribeiro. <laughs> and Ribeiro, there you go. But, yeah. um, and the two of them were, they've butt heads for years yeah. online. So but, it's like, and then as soon as she shows up, he's not there. And they're like, don't think anything about it. He just had to work. And I'm like, mm, did he though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, <laughs> but on, on, on a good note, um, the, uh, all the discussion of James Avery and his impact on the young actors was really touching. Yeah. I was, I was, I mean, I didn't know any of that, like that, that he was that much of, I mean, you, you kind of assume that like, you know, the older, the, 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 the older, more accomplished actors are going to be, they're going to take the younger actors under their wing, but he was like, he had a profound impact yeah. on, yeah. on all the, all the actors awesome. that played the kids. Everything that I had touching. ever seen him in was amazing like he was a great actor like everybody you know everybody thinks you know uncle phil is really funny and all that stuff but he's you know he came from like theater doing a lot of dramatic acting uh everything that he ever did was amazing so like i mean kudos to that guy and just to know that he was so into his craft that he was like he's gonna pass it on and make sure that the kids you know the any other actors that were acting with him were gonna be better actors for having been alongside him in that creative endeavor. I think that that's awesome. Like, I think and, it's amazing. And the responsibility that he instilled in them, that you, you have a voice now, like yeah. you're not, you're not just a person on TV making everybody laugh. We're going to be tackling social issues and people are going to associate the, these things with you and you have a responsibility yep. going yep. forward and, and, and instilling that in the, in, in the cast, particularly like, um, uh, What's what's her name? Tatiana something Ali. The the yeah, Tatiana she Ali. played Ash. She played mm -hmm. she played Ashley. Um, she was you know the youngest of the cast and everything. She was you know she remarked how like you know she she took a great deal away from her relationship yeah. with with James Avery, um, which made me a little. I got a little teared up. I'll be honest. I was like, they clearly really love this man, and he yeah, was no, they incredibly important to them. <laughs> I cried as well. I mean, well, I mean, but also growing up for me, like, you know, whenever there was a, you know, a black dad on the screen, I was like, that's my dad. No. <laughs> so, you know, I was, I was always looking at all the, at all the black men as like examples. 
So, and, and honestly, and that made it that made it like it was really interesting to have the collection of like black fathers on TV that we did, you know, because obviously we had Uncle Phil, we had Dr. Huxtable, uh, we had. Um, you know, and, and whatever you want to say about Bill Cosby, like, but Dr. Huxtable was a pretty good doc. He was a good guy. I like that guy. Yeah. Um, James but, Evans. Uh, James Evans, who is. Uh, good East times. Family, right? Good times. Good times. Yes. Yeah. I, well, that was a little bit before my time. I it was really a little before it. your time, but it was a kind of a big deal at the time, too, because it, yeah, yeah, until yeah. until the guy left the show because of differences about what the show was about. It was it was presenting a, a black family, a cohesive black family unit. Yeah. No, and um, I and I love in a, that in, guy. A, in, a, in a lower class situation that was like that was a big deal for television yeah. at the yeah. time. That actor, I love that guy. Like anytime I've seen him and stuff. John like, Amos, I've probably. never seen anything that he's in spectacular in. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I mean, so I mean, it was just it's it was it was cool to grow up at a time, and you know, nowadays there's so there's actually like so many more options for people to see themselves represented. But like at that time, there was really only a handful and un like Uncle Phil was one of those, you know, uh, and that was, it was a big deal. There was, a, there, was a, there was kind of a period where it was like, there was one for a while and then that person wasn't on the show anymore or the show ended and then there would be one other and it took a while, and like you can literally go back and say, okay, oh, like, it was good times and then it was, you know, it was the Cosby show and then it was, Uncle Phil on Fresh Prince, and there, you know, like yeah, there weren't a lot about as far as like really big popular shows that got a lot of eyes on it. There weren't a lot of others, and it, it's certainly different now. Yeah, it was basically how how black men are treated on The Walking Dead. You know, so, <laughs> you know, there's only room for one. Another one can't come on until that one's dead. Uh, so there's just a, a cycle of dead black dudes being. It's replaced. the same for gay characters. What's that? that? It's the same for gay characters on that show. Yeah, that too. They, they, they murder off the gay characters like as quickly yeah. as they possibly can. Well, I think um, too, I think it's like, you know, it's weird, right? It's, it, it's so funny because like, I'll have conversations with, you know, trans people, gay people, and they'll be like, and did you notice that thing that was in that show? And I'll be like, I did not notice at all. I noticed that the black person died, but I did not <laughs> notice the thing that you noticed because it's just, it doesn't stand out to me, you know? Yeah. So like, you know, and the, I don't, and I don't notice any of it because I'm a white dude. Until well, I, I hear people talking about it on social media afterwards, and I'm like, "Holy shit, you're right." Well, and, <laughs> yeah. well and that's to say is like, so like, I will have to actually pay more attention because I didn't actually realize that there was an issue with gay characters on The Walking Dead. I, I definitely knew the one with not even black women because there's been a couple of black women and, and women of color in general that come and they stick around. It's the dudes that keep dying. Like they just like cycle them through. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but, oh, just a note on uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air too. Cause I started, like I said, I started rewatching it. Mm -hmm. Um, and w when it was on, I didn't watch it like every time, you know, every, every night it was on, I kind of caught it here and there. Um, but then for years afterwards, I caught it in reruns. Um, but when you catch mm -hmm. things in syndication, it's all, you know, just episodes here and there. It's out of order. Yeah. Um, so I lose track of all the kind of stuff like the episode where Carlton and Will are driving the car and it's, it's a car belonging to like oh, yeah, the BMW. Uncle, yeah. Phil, yeah, Uncle Phil's law partner, white guy. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they don't know where they're going. So they're, and it's night and they're in the wrong neighborhood and they're driving slow and they get pulled over and the cops are racist and they haul them in. And, and it, you know, everybody, you know, if you want to watch the show, you know, the episode I'm talking about. Exactly. That was the eighth. That was the eighth episode of the show. They wasted oh, yeah. no time. Like that was like, oh, yeah. I was like, it, you know, watching it in syndication, you don't think about it. You're like, oh, well, you know, once the show's on the air for a couple of years then they can really start tackling issues. And it's like, no, they were, they were nailing stuff like in the single digits. They were having an episode yeah. that was very, almost, you know, two thirds of it is about, oh, black men that just got pulled over by the cops and hauled into jail. Yeah. Well, and that, that it's interesting because that whole first season was, you know, it's weird because it was supposed to be there to kind of break uh, Will Smith into the high living and, you know, where he was in Bel Air and all that stuff. But it all, it, for me, it was mostly when you were watching it, it was mostly just trying to bring these characters who seemed divorced from, you know, what it meant to live as a black person, you know, because they're living in Bel Air and they're surrounded by all these affluent, you know, you know, white people, not necessarily, uh, you know, 
the people from the streets and who come from ghettos and, you know, you know, projects and stuff. So for me, a lot of it was Will Smith bringing that energy there. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And by the second season, like he had already taught the people there so many lessons. Like that was one for Carlton, but like, you know, uh, Ashley and him were immediately like besties and she was trying to copy them. And, oh, you know, yeah. And she, she wants to play the drums and she learns to rap and exactly. you know, like all the, so, she was where she had previously been, you know, doing ballet and, and playing, was it violin or piano or something? Right. And, you know, where like she was being given a certain path and a certain, like, these are the things that we want you to, you know, the finer things in life. And then she suddenly yeah. exposed to will and, uh, some of, uh, of black culture that she just doesn't see. Yeah. Where, and I, and where I, she I, was. Yeah. They did. They, they all three, all three of the kids like were influenced yeah. just in different Probably, ways. I think, I think Hillary was the most resistant uh, to it. Cause she was so aloof most of the time. Like it, well, took long it, it was, get. it was interesting because she was significantly older. Keep sure. in mind when, when the show starts, the will and Carlton are sophomores in high school. She is 21. Oh, wow. Okay. Um. So, so realistically, if, if 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 the writers were playing it smart, and it seems like they were, like she's going to be harder to swing because she's twenty one. She's developed right. who she is. She's discovered like kind of her what she considers her comfortable place in life, and so she yeah. doesn't kind of do. She doesn't change as much as Carlton or Ashley. Did. Yeah, she really didn't. I mean, from my memory, I haven't rewatched it, but yeah, I remember like it took significantly longer for her to come around to Will than it did. You know Carlton, who was kind of same agey, uh, or Ashley, who was even younger. Very uh, impressionable. And very impressionable, exactly. Anyway, I don't know how this became a conversation about fresh. <laughs> no, that's Blair. great. That's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> I love. I, how I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk about mid maxing for a full hour. We figure we'll yeah. start with that and we'll just see. We where could it have. Though. I could have. <laughs> um, well, I, I do want to just say uh, we did miss out on uh, this Wednesday's game. Uh, one Ooh. of my players was sick. So, um, and she didn't want to miss out. So I'm like, well, well then we'll just push it back. So we're definitely, so our plan was this week was going to be third week and next week was going to be the last, the finale, but we're just going to push it back. So next week is going to be the third week. And then we're going to have another week after that. So we are going to finish it off. We're still going to do four episodes. Same uh, here. I ended up missing last weekend. Same way. Oh gosh. Because of, uh, one of the players, uh, had a life thing that kind of got up, got a came up and I was also in the throes of a cold, which I probably could have pushed my way through if I had to. Um, but I was happy to not have to <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I was, I was coughing a lot and uh, just uncomfortable. Yeah, no, that makes sense. No. And and that's honestly like, you know, if somebody says that they're not feeling well, like, cool, it's good. Like I'm, I'm not, you know, I know that I, when I feel, when I feel bad, I don't want to game. So I'm not going to, you know, force anybody or, you know, push anybody to do something that they're not going to want to do. But just so everybody knows who might be watching this, we are coming back next week. We're going to have, you know, new stuff, uh, even though we missed, uh, you know, this week. So there you go. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, I'm, I say that that's, that's a good uh, hour episode. So I say we uh, go ahead and end it there. Uh, thank Sounds you to like everybody for watching this. And, um, yeah, well, we did veer away from min maxing, but you know, give us your thoughts on min maxing. <laughs> you know, we we will bring it up in other um, in other conversations. Don't forget that these are our uh, Twitter handles. So hit us up on Twitter uh, if you want to continue the min max versus story driven characters uh, discussion. There you go. All right. See everybody later. Bye. <laughs>